All right, welcome to the English 1060 lecture about the analytical process. This is just, even though you've been doing a lot of analysis with your homeworks, with your essays, you know, I just want to kind of get a little bit more into exactly what we're doing when we analyze. Because as I showed you with the most recent homework with the sources, we really have to apply the analytical process when we're researching. It's very important. So what do we do, right? So the best word, right, if we we're going to look for synonyms, right, is a breakdown, a dissection, right? An analysis is a lot like dissection. You divide a text or an event or person, right, because we can analyze people, into its basic components. In the academic setting, most analytical papers involve some sort of close reading of literature, film, music, history, theories, right? Any idea or concept can be closely read, can be analyzed. And we're breaking it down. So what's important, and this is where we get into crucial concepts, to analyze something is to ask what it means, right? And that's what we really want to look for. When you're researching, right, what do these sources mean for your argument? What do they mean overall? An analytical essay answers how something does what it does or why it is as it is. Now, even though your research project is heavily evaluation based, you have to apply the analytical process to most of your supporting paragraphs. You're going to be giving evidence. You're going to be you know, giving us constant support. You're going to be asking these questions of how and why, right? How does this field benefit us? Why does this field exist, right? So you're really going to be asking very important analytical questions as well as evaluative ones. So when we get to kind of a thesis statement, uh, and, and you could really turn essay 4 into an analytical essay beyond evaluation, a thesis statement and an analysis paper should be answering again a how and why question. So a strong thesis makes a claim about the subject right, that needs proving. It provides the writer and reader with a clearly focused lens through which to view the subject. And so an analytical thesis explores the purpose and reason for the way in which a work, idea, or event is constructed. And you could always see, you know, and we'll hopefully write, you know, as you're thinking about essay 4 in the annotated bibliography, this is exactly what you're doing with your major, right? You could easily turn the research project into an analytical paper. And so, because you're exploring the reason for a major. So, it investigates the how and why behind the functioning of all components. Go back to the thesis lecture. I gave you a good example of an analytical thesis. The life of a typical UNCP student is characterized by time spent working at school, uh, excuse me, working a job, going to school, and socializing with peers, right? Even though this is probably a very agreeable statement, most of us would agree, it still has a degree of uncertainty, right? This author still has to prove to us what the hell a typical student is, right? What a UNCP student, right? A typical UNCP student is. And then how their lives are characterized by these three major factors, job, school, and fun, right? And so even though this is not a, you know, aggressively debatable idea, it still needs proving. And this is what analysis does. It breaks down, in this case, the life of a typical student. So there's a further breakdown of what the hell a typical student is as opposed to an atypical student. So there's already a, a logical breakdown there. And then we have the three components here that are what make up this life, right, that we're analyzing. And so we have to prove still that these categories exist. So the writer first needs to establish a criteria what exactly is a typical student, right? Although the statement is more explanatory, a writer still needs to prove that these three components exist in that typical student's life. The writer will also need many concrete examples that prove that these conditions in fact exist for many UNP students. So excuse me, UNCP students. So it's crucial that we recognize that the analytical process is an investigative one, but it's also an argumentative one. When we analyze, we are breaking down. And what we're doing when we analytically argue is showing how that breakdown works. And so a weak thesis either makes no claim or is an assertion that doesn't need proving. It's a fuzzy lens which will not really help the writer or reader, of course, be guided by a better understanding of the subject. And that's the whole purpose, right? We want to be guided to a better understanding of your field of study.
So most weak thesis statements suffer because they're overly broad or really not specific enough. So let's look at an analytical thesis that's weak, right? It will have a broad noun, some kind of weak verb. There might even be an evaluated adjective or just direct objects that are vague. And so here's a good example, right? Today's economic situations have many factors. This is not a breakdown because there's no real argument here. Well, of course, any situation will have factors, right? And especially if we're talking about the economy. Any kind of a economic situation will have factors. We don't even know wh where we're talking about, right? We don't know what country's economy. We, today is a very vague noun. Is Are we ta really talking about, you know, 2015? Are we, where are we talking about? And when are we talking about? So the lack of detail and specificity makes this thesis underdeveloped and clearly uninteresting. Same thing, it's the difference between Robert Frost writes about birds, right? Well, that's not an analysis because that's true. What do the birds symbolize? Well now you're getting into an analytical argument, right? There's no argument here because yes it is true Robert Frost about, writes about birds as do most poets and so we really want to look at again the meaning. So with these two examples we have we have to look at the meaning behind these issues. And so a strong analytical thesis would look like this, right? We have a specific noun, we have an active verb, some sort of assertive predicate. So I pulled uh, f from a student essay. The tax policies of the current administration reduced the tax burden on the middle class by cutting education and health care programs for everyone. Well, again, in the introduction, the student already established what current administration they were talking about. But here we have a clear goal in mind, right? What are they doing? They're analyzing how the reduction of the tax burden on the middle class will occur by, again, cutting education and health care programs. So there are clear, specific ideas here that we're going to analyze. The person has to analyze the reduction of the tax burden overall, how it affects the middle class, and how specifically the cutting of education and the cutting of health care will reduce this tax burden, right? So there's a clear argument. Now again, you could kind of see a bias here, but it has a clear plan of analysis and argumentation. We And we could see, especially in this example, I think, as opposed to the UNCP student example, this one is clearly argumentative because we could look at the data and say, well, no, 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 you know, keeping education, you know, might reduce the tax burden, but also create other problems, right? Or, you know, health, cutting health care will increase, you know, the tax burden in a few because everyone's going to be unhealthy. So we could clearly, you know, argue against this. But again, this is an analysis. It's not blaming anyone. It's not judging anyone. It's just saying, okay, here's what's going to happen. It's a cause and effect statement. And so analysis can take you to a very important level of argumentation, right, without, of course, any judgment. So the best way to remedy any problems with overgeneralization is always move toward that specificity in word choice, sentence structure, idea. All these words are, and phrases are very helpful in an analysis. In order to, for the purpose of, by, because, which demonstrates that, which reveals, which is significant because, right? These phrases should really become part of your regular vernacular because they show you're answering a how or why question, right? Th this major is helpful because of this, right? The fact that everyone gets a job demonstrates that blank, 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 right? Um, so, you know, these type of statements, right, excuse me, these type of phrasings, right, will really increase the argumentative stance in your essays, right? And having these, especially in your topic sentences, will help increase that argument. Now, I'm going to give you an example of a thesis statement for a film analysis and I want us uh, you know who, who are currently attending to kind of just kind of oh hold on I need to a uh, I need to uh, plug in my battery hold on for a second and it doesn't matter by having the main character Brian Mills Liam Neeson avoid any punishment for killing several dozen people in Taken Pierre Morel who is the director reinforces the cultural assumption that America knows best and should be allowed to police the world without any consequences Okay. So again, just to kind of recap, th this argument is about symbolism, it's about representation, it's about meaning, right? What does this character mean? And so we could argue that this character 
represents America. We could disagree and argue that this character represents fatherhood, right? We could disagree and argue that this character represents, you know, the glorification of violence, right? There's all sorts of numerous interpretations we can take. What we're really getting at here is subtext, and this is a crucial concept because not all people understand subtext, and this creates a lot of communication issues. So regardless of approach, right, what we're doing when we analyze is looking for subtext. That's our goal. Subtext is the underlying meaning behind what is said or written. And that is a concept that shouldn't exist, but it does because we speak in metaphors. You know, meta you know subtext exists, right? Metaphors could not exist without subtext, right? If we were strictly a literal denotative species, metaphors can exist. Idioms couldn't exist, right? All sorts of things that we do with language couldn't exist. I could never tell you, you know, I could never say, oh, excuse me, I cut the cheese, right? Because that, that makes no sense, right? And there's subtext connected to our language, and it pisses people off, and some people who have social anxiety disorders, uh, for example, like Asperger's, don't really understand, or autism, they don't understand subtext, and so there's a, a lot of issues there with communication. If you ever watch Big Bang Theory, Sheldon is a perfect representation of someone who doesn't understand subtext. So, you know, it, it's, it's a crucial concept though for people who are going to be in the real world and so what it is it's the implicit oftentimes metaphorical meaning so subtext is the meaning we derive from what is not directly stated or presented which is again is a crazy concept if I if I give you words right if I give you a sentence full of words those words should mean what they mean right they should just mean always what they mean the best example I could give you, and you know this already, and if you're in a relationship, you've communicated in subtext all the time. If I, like, let's say at the start of this session, and everybody asked me how I was, and I just go, well, I'm fine. Right? You know that I'm not fine because of my intonation. You don't even have to see my body language. You know that something's amiss because of my tone, right? No, I'm fine. Right, you, you know something's wrong. But again, I'm lying to you because I, you know, I technically said I'm fine, but you know that I'm not fine because of my tone, my you know filler word or filler sound. Right, you know something's amiss, and this is very crucial because it shows us how much we are geniuses. We we really are you know very you know genius like at many moments in our lives, because we can understand these kind of high concepts of subtext. We encode subtext to understand it, and that's what's crucial. Again, words should mean what they mean, but they mean more. And, and this is what's a very interesting concept. And so when we get to issues of exercising our analytical brains, the, these are very important concepts. The best example I could give you is a personal example that I have encountered in my life. Uh, but in writing and speaking situations, right, we could easily find subtext through the implication aspect. This is a perfect question. What could you possibly do with an English degree? So let's think about this a moment for those of us in the room. Is this a positive question or a negative question? What's the purpose of this question? No, because we don't have her telling us, and this is why, you know, why it's a good um, scene in terms of subtext, because you know, Rachel doesn't say, you're a stupid father, Dad, or you're a terrible father, Dad, or you're an uncaring father. How do we know? Good, right? So he doesn't know his daughter, right? And so, the, and this is what is important, right? About this scene, right? Exactly. Our expectations of a good father, our cultural reinforced expectations of a good father, should know what his daughter's allergies are, right? And so the fact that he doesn't know, she's had it since birth, and that's again the key word, right? You know, we know that he's a terrible father. We can determine the subtext by inferring that, of course, a good father would know his daughter's allergies. And that's the key aspect, right? That since when birth, right? Because if he was a good father, if he was a caring father, even if they were divorced, right, he should still know what his daughter's you are allergic to, right? And so that's the key issue. And again, we don't get the Rachel character saying, you're a bad father. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, because he could, in this situation, kill her, right? And so the, 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 the realism and the danger here further reinforces 
us as audience members reinforces the idea that this guy is a jackass, right? That this guy is a bad father. But again, what's important about this scene is she doesn't say, you are a bad father, dad, you're an asshole, you almost killed me. That happens in the subtext, just with one word, birth. We get all of what you're saying, right? And that's what's very important, is because we recognize that everything that she says was just that one word.